Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's been an engaging morning um, full of sessions, lots of knowledge shared, lots of arguments about claims. I thought that was really interesting um, in the panel session in the morning. Um, and looking forward to this conversation today. Um, so we have Akin Jones. Is he here on the call? Um, he's a CEO of the Ela app, a credit and payment solutions fintech that has recently started selling a health insurance or offering a health insurance product. And we also have Dr. Babatunde Obraima, who is the CEO of the Fintech Association of Nigeria. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Man, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm good. Nice to be good. here. Good. Great to be here. Thanks. We're good. Great. So, um, Akin, I'm going to start with you. Um, there's an article um, on Medium from the Ella app talking about how looking at data of the reasons why people borrowed money from your platform, 25% of them stated that the reason was to be able to cover medical bills and that obviously now translated to you guys offering a health insurance product so i'd like to start with you telling us a little bit about that and how in the process of developing this offering um you have tried to be inclusive um because even though nigeria is a country of large numbers majority of the population is Poor and their needs are very diverse. So I'd like to hear a little bit from you about that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, I think, you know, it all started uh, just basically by looking at the data. So in 2015, we kicked off as one of the initial digital lenders in the Nigerian market. Uh, we probably like to tell say we were probably the first digital lender in the Nigerian markets. So we took a big risk when no one else would take a risk or venture into that space. We're talking early 2015, when we would go to banks, they would just laugh. Like, what are you talking about? Can someone actually give a loan and pay back via their phones? And so uh, we started to see the same trend. So over the year, we've grown to a million user uh, platform. And, you know, we, we started to see the trends in people who are taking loans on our platform. We give out about 1,000, 1,500 loans a day. And, you know, most of the reasons were for um, healthcare reasons, so you say buying drugs and those use, uh, that kind of usage. And, you know, it, it just dawned on us that, you know, if people are taking these uh, micro loans and these mini sized loans, we're talking anywhere from um 5000 naira to 100000 naira to pay for medical expenses um then there has to be an opportunity here uh you know we started to plow through the data and we you know we started to ask ourselves what what is the main reason that we are seeing that people aren't getting insurance you know and it's in our opinion we think it's four things we think it's something i like to call tape uh, you know trust access, pricing, and education. Um, you know, we just, there's not enough trust in the market. Uh, you know, there's a cultural issue, like we've heard earlier, that Nigerians just don't trust insurance. You know, be it your class level, a lot of people just don't trust that insurance companies are going to pay back when when they went due. Uh, and a good example, we'll say, is during this whole NSARS protest when things were destroyed. Um we, you know, people, a good, it would have been a good marketing tool, at least for insurance companies, to show how they were covering those damages, you know, because that's part of the type of psychological thought process people have about insurance. Uh, the second would be access. You know, how can you distribute this to rural areas? How can you distribute this uh, countrywide? And, you know, for us, we we're, the access is we're already giving loans. We're already giving thousands of loans a day. We already have people on our platform. So, you know, why not drive off that platform? Uh, then price. Uh, pricing is always going to be sensitive because you're going to lose money before you make money if you want to penetrate insurance really into the rural areas. You can't just think of it like a pure profit from a pure profit perspective as most Nigerian organizations would think about this. Because um, when you're trying to scale a product, you can use any product from Facebook to the digital lenders. You're going to take that hit, that hit to get people to acclimatize to that product. And, you know, the last but not the least uh, is education. Um, we, you know, we have to educate people about insurance, the use of insurance, the benefits of insurance. And, you know, the insurance companies might have to create more creative products in the sense that 
maybe if those premiums are not used, uh, maybe there are products in which you can get your premium back. And, you know, those are some of the things that got us thinking. And that's why we launched this. And, you know, we've seen pretty good traction so far. Um, it's not been as exciting as we would have expected. Penetration is not as high as I would have personally hoped. But, you know, it, you know, you know, it's doing well. You know, we, we started off with 30-day free trials. The question is just what is the drop-off rate after that 30-day free trial? It's, you know, it's done. When you say um, the take up and penetration is not as high as you had expected it to see, is there anything that you're seeing as to the reason why that is? Is it just the year that 2020 has been, or perhaps is it maybe a bit more in terms of education of people not really understanding what insurance, you know, the benefit insurance can provide for them and their families? You know, I'd say one is trust and two is pricing. Uh, I think it just takes time to build trust with people that, you know, uh, that as a reseller of insurance, uh, that, you know, that people will, you know, buy into this, that they're going to, they are going to cover everything you say you're going to cover that, you know, you're saying you're giving what 500,000 to 800,000 worth of insurance cover. And, you know, people want to believe that this is true. And on the insurance side too, you have to understand that, you know, they're going to need more people to use this product for it to be worth it for them because they're not also in the business to lose money. Um, so it's, it's kind of like a chicken and the egg thing. Uh, you know, on one hand, a lot of people are poor. Like, you know, we did this auto debit where you can put your card in and, you know, we can automatically debit your account every month. And, you know, maybe two, two, three out of 10 people actually have their cards funded or their accounts funded for an expense as small as 2000 naira. So, uh, or even as small as 500 naira, you know? So when you think about it, you know, a lot of the macros are sometimes the biggest problem. We have some major macroeconomic issues as a country we're facing now. And I feel like as those get better, maybe we'll see a surge in insurance. Hmm. Great. Fantastic. Dr. Brymard, um, my next question um, is for you. You're the CEO of the FinTech Association of Nigeria. And your mission um, is really about supporting all stakeholders to achieve a thriving and growing fintech industry. So in what ways, you know, is a fintech association planning to work with insure techs or to support them to encourage, you know, the few that are playing in the space? Thank you very much. Um, for us, I mean, we, we're driven by three objectives. The first one is Connect, being able to bring together people within the uh, fintech ecosystem because we're an ecosystem association. So, I mean, we have over 15 different sectors within the association. The second one is to accelerate se- technological growth. And the third is advocacy to ensure that there are progressive regulatory reforms to support uh, creativity and innovation within the tech space. So, I mean, what we've done or what we've started doing is the fact that we've started talking with the regulator, which is NAICOM, about the need to have a fintech or an insure tech roadmap for the insurance sector. And I know that they are doing some things in-house, which they will eventually, I mean, bring to the open. But while waiting for regulators, because, I mean, the, the general trend is that technology is always ahead of regulation. So regulators try to do catch-up. So while waiting for them, we have engaged the operators. And what we've done is to work with NIA to start a training on digitization because it's really important that for insure tech to be able to uh to 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 be established properly in nigeria the operators more understand the dynamics of digitization so we had in uh, that was in september a training called digital 101 and we had over 240 insurers attending that. In general, we're having what you call Digital 201, which looks at insure tech, product development, I mean, uh, social marketing, you know, and uh, being able to uh, develop products that are appropriate. I think that one of the biggest challenges which Akito had alluded to is the fact that, I mean, we need to deal with the issue of trust. They need to expand the the market. So, I mean, when I look at insurance, I mean, from a... buyer's perspective, I mean, you've, you've cut off a whole lot of people. And in, in, in business, the higher the risk, the higher the premium. Also, I mean, I know insurance works on probability. So, I mean, if 
you say that above 65, you are cut off. That's a huge market, really, you know. And so if at that age you want to increase premium for life insurance, for health insurance, but taking them out completely, I think that they, they need to look at that. I mean, a few years ago, the Harvard Business Review did a publication called It's Time to Retire Retirement. I mean, and that's because people are living healthier and they're living longer. You know, um, even in Nigeria, academicians now retire at 70, judges retire at, retire at 70. So we need to look at those dynamics again, you know, and how do we deal with those issues, bringing more people into, because I believe that insurance can actually help to stimulate financial inclusion. I mean, so so far, financial inclusion is about money people to open accounts. But I think that financial inclusion is about selling benefits to people. You know, I use I give this example that look, my my parents are eighty seven and 80, 85. And my dad runs his account. My mom doesn't. Her account is dormant, and she's not interested in running it. If you send, if anybody wants to send money to my mom, she says send it to send it to me. So I get it, and I now find out I'm going to get it across to her. <laughs> but if you go to her and you probably want to sell her health insurance, she'll probably listen to you because at that age, they deal with, I mean, health issues, but you've cut them off. You know? So I mean, we need to look at that. Look at, I mean, let's take agriculture, for example. The average farmer, I mean, if you were to, for financial inclusion, talking to me about insurance for scorpion bites or snake bites, my interest in rather than saying come and open an account, but in doing that, you get him to open an account. So I think that it's looking at benefits and insurance as can come up with varied products that, what's it called, can uh, attract, uh, can bring in more people into the space. I mean, uh, I think that, so for us as an association, we think that capacity development is critical. So let's start with uh, that's uh, digital literacy with operators, with regulators, you know, and then we can now go to, I mean, once the operators and regulators are ready, it's now easier to go to, uh, to, to the buyers to be able to sell to them and then build trust into it. I mean, that's a big, a big, big challenge. But I mean, for us as an association, we are, I mean, because when we look at it, the tech has just less than uh, 3% of the tech uh, um, operator, I mean, in terms of uh, participants in the tech space. So in short tech is just about 3% of the total uh, tech space. That's small. And when you look at penetration, it's le- at less than 2%. That's a huge space where there's a whole lot of opportunity. So we think that um, let's start with capacity development and it's easier to do the rest. Fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Obama. Well, I'm going to throw that back um, to Akin. Does your health insurance offering cover people over 60 or are they not allowed to sign up? And if the answer is no, why? Oh, it does cover people over 60. Uh, it's a partnership with IGEA and the plan we have is, is, you know, it really just depends on what... Um, what exactly the kind of plan they're signing up because we have different plans and actually we're bringing more partners onto the uh, platform. So the, the goal is, you know, we're just trying to find more effective plans. It can't just be a youth focused plan. So it does cover a wide variety of ages. Fantastic. One of the recurring things that keeps coming back from, you know, your comments and the conversations that we had yesterday is the issue of trust and people not trusting um, insurance companies and their offerings, and also people not having that level of education and understanding of the value that insurance can provide. From both of you, who do you really think you know should be driving it, educating people about insurance? You know, is it the responsibility of the regulator? Is it the responsibility of you know organizations like yours, Akin? You know, or are we waiting for you know international development organizations and nonprofits like the FinTech Association? Who's really going to take on that job to help people understand and educate them? Hi, my name is Joel Masharia. I'm the co-founder of Motishua, where we provide last mile distribution of microinsurance products. Keep listening to the InsureTech business series to get the latest on insurance and InsureTech within and outside of Africa. Um, you know, I can take that first. Um, I think for me, I think we all have a role to play. 
Um, I think, you know, individual companies definitely have a role to play, but the government still plays a major role. The regulators still have to play a major role. I think, you know, um, we can see more, you know, the health insurance act being that, that was being debated in the Senate that was about, you know, that, that, you know, and, but the goal is the government really needs to put a lot more money towards healthcare. I think, you know, having two, two billion dollars, $3 billion towards health care for Nigeria um, as, in, as our health, total health care budget for a country of 200 million people is just too small. Um, you know, I think insurance companies need to be somewhat subsidized. Um, you know, I know there's a national health insurance scheme, but, you know, I think there has to be a more effective plan towards subsidizing insurance. You know, I've heard of schemes in universities. I know Unilag had one and probably still has one now whereby students, you know, pay a very minute sum for insurance. And I think it just has to be mandated the same way car insurance is mandated. You know, um, you know, healthcare is a right. Um, and so we have to find more effective ways to get it to people. And we all have to work together. You can't leave the book on the government alone, but the government plays a major part because in a country like Nigeria, where governments, governments, government is everything and government plays a very key role in everything that happens, you know, them putting that first foot forward and actually driving it, you know, everything from, you know, I, I guess you could start from um, primary school and have the students in primary school actually mandate every primary school, every student must be insured. Maybe there's a fee taken out or is a subsidized insurance plan working with, you know, large scale insurance companies, you know, if we can distribute loans to, you know, millions of people, we're talking right now on the digital lending space, the amount of loans that we push out, you know, there's no reason why we can't get insurance. Of course, if government subsidized and if there's a clear working plan to millions of people, you know, we've seen the telcos uh, at some point uh, play a role whereby, you know, they were um, offering insurance via phones, you know, and, you know, of course the government and the regulators said you couldn't, you couldn't debit people, um, debit people um, uh, from their airtime. But, you know, these are some of the things that might have to be revisited because, you know, Nigeria as a country should be treated as a startup. You know, I think when we, when we, when our administrators look at this country, the whole country needs to stop treating itself like this big humongous organization, but has to go back and treat itself like a startup and figure out ways in which it can maneuver and make things happen, but not always in a very structured path, you know, is my own two cents. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Dr. Baima. Yes. Um, I think that, I mean, the, one of the ways to deal with the issue of trust is data. So, I mean, we need to be able to say, this is data. Uh, we have, 10,000 people insured. We have 2,000 who made claims and they were paid. So like you say in church, testimony to, to, <laughs> to, to, to show that. So if I know that within my community, somebody had a challenge and was paid, it gives me more confidence to do it. So if in even for micro insurance, if you do that in the in the, in the villages, and I mean, this guy's a snake bite, he gets hospital treatment free, he has, um, he has a motorcycle accident, he gets treated free. I mean, because he's insured, he builds trust and people can say it. So I think that data is important and they need to create that. Um, I think the insurance needs to be more visible in terms of talking about what they've done. I mean, now bad insurance claims and they were paid. So, I mean, you need to use that as a way to let people know that uh, Find them might be maybe the, this old perception. This is a new perception. I mean, so I mean, there's a need to to do that. So I think data and uh, showing evidence of what has been done is critical to be able to build uh, to build trust. Fantastic. We've got a few um, and questions in the chat box that I'm just going to go over before we move on to the next thing. Um, the first is from Otto. Obon Idem, and I think this is for you, Dr. Brima, um, in regards to the digitalization trainings you mentioned, the question is, what does it take to attend such training, or is that only open to, you know, the public sector and the regulators? Are you planning to do that on, you know, a larger scale? Okay, I mean, for now, we, like I said, we're partnering with, uh, for us, collaboration is critical. I mean, um, so, 
all insurance companies should be with NIA, I guess. And uh, so we, we, we partner with NIA and they do the um, adverts to all the insurance companies. Now, we, we for the one we're planning for January, we've had that discussion. I think that some people, there was that question about what if the public wants to attend. And we say we'll probably leave it open I mean, for also for the public, so we'll advertise it. If people in the public want to attend, fine, that, that's good. But uh, that's, that, that's the way we are running presently. But um, because it's really important that let's start with the key operators and then public who might be interested can, can key in. So, I mean, it's good that that question has come so I can even let the NIA know that there's a need to not just advertise within the insurance circle, but to make it public so that people who are interested can also be part of it. Fantastic. Um, another comment from Fabio Yolisemi. Um, she's agreeing with you, Dr. O'Brien, that word of mouth um, is, a great is great advertising for insurance. Um, Witness Godwin says the educating should be done by all. Um, that's agreeing with Akin that um, it's a job for everyone, but regulators should be at the forefront. And this is a comment from Abimbola Onokomaya, who's the MD of Peak Thrust Insurance Brokers. Educating the public about insurance should be all inclusive since insurance covers every aspect of life and the economy from the cradle to the grave. So just going back again to talking about the regulators, um, what would you both like to see you know, from the regulators, fintechs and insurtechs, do kind of sort of share the same, a few of the same regulators. Looking forward to 2021, what would you like to see from the regulators that will make your jobs easier? Hello, this is Pat Callahan, the insurance elephant calling from near Buffalo, New York, about 5,300 miles from Lagos. I enjoy listening to the InsurTech business series without a demolo loco, because it proves that even though we are thousands of miles different, the insurance business is not that much different. The concepts and topics that are covered on the uh, InsurTech business series, not, they could be handled the same way right here in uh, Western New York State. So listen in. It's a great podcast, great global and local guests, and it just proves it's a small world for insurance. Um, I, th I, I would say, uh, just jumping in, I'd say something around sandboxes. And I, and I know this has been done more in the fintech space. I don't know how much it's been done in the insure tech space. I think sandboxes, hackathons, I think more meetings. Um, I, I think associations like uh, um, the Fintech Association of Nigeria are are very good. You know, I, th I think they act as a forefront uh, to the regulators and I, I think they act as a middleman to the regulators. So, you know, those associations are, are very much welcome and are very much good. Um, but, you know, more sandboxes, more hackathons, you know, I think it's very hard to get the college students or the university students who are building these very um, revolutionary products to meet regulators. Like where would a 20, 18 year old uh, boy who's in university working on some great products with friends and they have this great idea, where's that pathway um, for them to actually launch their product without huge capital um, and the huge capital constraints that exist. Um, I remember when we were starting, I remember how tough it was to come up with the capital. I remember what we had, you know, how difficult that was. So um, how do we, you know, build that system that, you know, our youth that are building these very interesting products have somewhere they can go. It can be on the Nikon site, like, hey, are you a startup building an insure tech product? This is the process. This is what you have to do. This is um, this is a step by step. Uh, you have to register here. You have to do this. You have to do this. So it kind of, and you also don't want the illegalities. You don't want the, you know, anyone fraudulent trying to get into the industry to do something that they're not supposed to be doing. But you also don't want to leave out the people who are innovating, but just because of capital constraints can't get their innovation out to the world. So that balance will come from people like the uh, FinTech Association of Nigeria, will come from the regulators, and, you know, will come from hosting more events that bring everything together, I think, uh, is my opinion. 
Thank you. Okay, um, I quite agree with um, Akin. There's a need to have more more hackathons. But the hackathons will be a function of defining what the pain points are, so people actually, I mean, um, are working towards providing solutions to the pain points that have been uh, identified. I also quite agree with the issue of having sandboxes. I mean, because when you look at it, even within the financial system, the cheapest license to get from CBN today is 50 million Naira. So where does a fresh graduate get that from? Um, so that's a huge, a huge challenge in terms of the um, licensing issues. I mean, which we, are, we keep discussing with the regulators and need to look at different regimes for, for licensing. I also think that, I mean, younger people, so younger people need to also look at how they can collaborate or partner. Um, that's a big challenge we also have in this environment. People don't, we all don't like partnerships. Everybody likes silos because it's mine. You know, so we need to deal with that mindset also. Um, I think the partnerships that will work, I mean, I always say that 1% of what is doing very well is better than what 100% of what's not doing well. So, I mean, those, you need to look at where can I get partnerships that will work for me and I'll still be, I'll still be, be good. So I think that um, the regulators, I mean, are responding. Um, what I would like to see from NICOM is that whatever they are doing in terms of the tech space should be um, inclusive. They should not, they should bring everybody, which is what, I mean, for us, we work with all the regulators, like for example, SEC will set up a committee, bring operators, bring regulators, bring all stakeholders, and we can come up with a roadmap. I think that I would like them to use that same kind of approach. So it's stakeholder participation rather than regulator um, saying, this is what we want to want you to, to, to do. So, I mean, for, but I think that, um, they, 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 there's a lot of opportunities. We can always keep, it will keep getting better. Like you say, we're a startup country. So we, we, we'll make the mistakes, but then we'll keep improving improving on them. The good thing is that they, even the government realizes the need for that technology is what's going to drive the future. And they need to, I mean, start putting uh, structures in place to be able to, to achieve that. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Braima. Um, I could just see Rob, who's joined the call. Thank you for joining us. Um, Rob is the author of a book called The End of Insurance as We Know It, and The Most Interesting Man in Insurance. Um, we've just been having a conversation about um, fintechs and insurtechs and how they can partner together for more inclusive insurance. Um, a question to all, I find that when we talk about inclusive insurance, you know, in Nigeria and in this part of the world, we tend to talk about micro insurance or health insurance specifically. So um, I don't know, Akin, are you planning to develop any other types of insurance or is health just the lowest hanging fruits that, you know, is useful to majority of people in this market? Uh, no, we, we're looking at, you know, partnering with other insurance companies uh, to roll out other products. Uh, we're, we're partnering with more companies on the health side. We're partnering uh, on the automobile side, on the equipment side. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of needs uh, on the insurance side. I think uh, it's just a step-by-step -step process. I feel like health, uh, you know, we, we launched during a time of COVID. Health was a very pertinent need. You know, health insurance, for lack of a better word, has better margins if well executed. Um, and so there's a lot of reasons why, you know, we decided to, to, to kick off with health. Um, there's, there's much more of a need for that, too. Uh, you always go where the need is. But, you know, our, our platform is going to be, you know, a wide array of insurance products that are going to launch soon. I think the, the key for us is how do we use um, artificial intelligence and the data we already have to be able to be smarter about insurance, be able to recommend insurance products to people who are paying bills on our platform or getting loans on our platform so that we can really get insurance to fit for each person who's looking for one. Fantastic. There's a question here um, that's come up in the chat box that's for you. Um, and it's from Otto Obong Idem. And he says, what makes um, the ELA app insurance offering different from buying directly from Hygieia? And why should people buy from your platform instead if it's a partnership with Hygieia? 
I think it's a great question. I think uh, for us, it's it's the experience. Uh, we want you to come in, you know, more flexible plans. Uh, we, you know, we allow you to buy monthly. Uh, we There's more perks, more giveaways, uh, more, you know, just a more user-friendly approach, which, you know, the average insurance company will see as crazy or as stupid trying to build that customer loyalty on a one-to-one basis with the user. And then there's also a bevy of other products you can, you know, you can get from us. Um, so it's really just, the customer centric experience that we're building. Um, and, you know, as time goes on, we'll be able to offer more customized products. Um, Hygieia as a partner has been a good one so far. And, you know, we have other partners coming on board um, and, you know, we'll be able to offer more flexible products and more people specific products. Cause the idea uh, product is specific for a particular type of customer, but for others, it just might not work. So, you know, we're building other products that fit, fit each customer's, uh, purview and that's the customer centric experience is where we offer value fantastic thank you right so my next question is for rob uh, when we talk about inclusive insurance it's not just about partnerships and working with the regulators and fintechs um, it's also about the people that work in the industry and in one of the chapters in your book you really talk a lot about you know the future workforce of the insurance industry and how things like technology are changing that. Um, you've had a 25 year career working in insurance, you know, um, and you've written this book now. So I guess just to wrap up, I'd like you to talk a little bit about, you know, how we can make the workforce more inclusive and the skills that, you know, people really need to develop and insurance companies and insure techs um, need to look out for or, train up in the people that they already employ? It's a fantastic question. Uh, you know, you heard earlier, right, talk about artificial intelligence and we're going through a complete revolution really in insurance. It's uh, a very old industry, but in some ways it's, it's still very young and, and very immature and uh, has a lot of opportunity to grow and to meet the full needs um, of everybody, not just in in a couple of segments. Um, And technology is going to lead the way. So we already are seeing that in in some instances, and we're going to continue to see that um, over the next decade and beyond. That's something that was really striking to me as a career professional um, over the past 25 years, and and really in the last five, seeing um, what technology was going to do for our industry for the next 25 years. Um, which I don't think will look anything like my first 25 years in the industry. Um, But at the end of the day, this is still uh, about humans and it's still about needs and it's about empathy. Um, Risk has not changed. In fact, if it, if anything, it's gotten, you know, more risky, we have more exposure, we have more things that we need to be protected from. Uh, And we can't always rely on on technology, nor will we want to, right? We want humans to be there at our time of need. So it's really about um, having technology be there when we want it to be there, certainly during the purchasing process, uh, to manage policies, et cetera. Uh, But then we want humans to to be there during the claims process. They don't have to be there throughout. I think technology can help, but it's really the companies uh, that understand when do we want a machine and when do we want a human. Um, And I also think that uh, young people uh, are really critical to making us successful. Um, People today um, that are are entering the industry, um, they're digital natives, right? They have been using this advanced technology um, throughout their entire lives and they're accustomed to the pace of technological change where somebody like myself, um, I I try to keep up, I try to learn it, um, but it's harder. And so I, I think just those traditions of, you know, the, the elders, the most senior people, right, should be running the company or making decisions. I don't think it should always be that way. You know, we, we need to make sure that we're hearing an array of voices from people with different backgrounds, different experiences, um, and really bringing that to bear to serve everybody's needs. So it can't just be um, that, you know, the most senior people make all the decisions because uh, they aren't necessarily in the best position to make sure that the company is moving forward uh, to meet Uh, tomorrow's needs. Fantastic. Thank you, Rob. We've got just a few more minutes to wrap up. So I think I'm just going to 
go back to the beginning um, from you, Akin, just your final thoughts um, on how we can work together, fintechs and insurtechs, to provide more inclusive um, solutions for all. Um, I, I feel like um, it's all about sacrifice. I feel like um, insurance companies are have co some governance structures that might make it very difficult for them to effectively partner with technology companies. And I feel like those companies have to go back internally and rethink how they operate and rethink what thesis or what ethos they believe their partnerships should be about. And, sh you know, like what kind of sacrifices do we want to make? Are we willing to share or do we feel like, oh, we can do it all in-house? Is it not just to hire some engineers to come in and build it for us? Um, tech is about iteration. It's about being able to look at the product and continuously iterate. You know, since when we launched our product in roughly April, May, we've iterated at least three to four times and there's one more iteration coming. And this is all about learning from our users versus a very big corporate governance structure that might take 10 layers of approvals to get things through. So are you going to be able to build little silos in within your organizations that are going to foster creativity and foster partnerships? I think that's the question I'm throwing to the insurance companies. And for us tech companies, are we going to be able to boost up our risk management processes, be able to put the capital, raise the right amount of capital to also share this risk with the insurance companies? If we can do that, the sky is the limit for this, um, this market, this sector. Um, the opportunity is endless. 3% on $200 million. Uh, Insurance is where you need to be right now, be fintech, be wherever. So we're excited. Thank you. Thank you, Akin. Um, and we just got a comment um, agreeing with your point that the management structure of underwriting firms will make it a bit challenging to holistically partner full time with technology companies. So, uh, Dr. Obrima, your final thoughts and then Rob, your thoughts as well. Well, I mean, um, there's no doubt that collaboration is key. Um, for us as association, we'll keep um, looking at how we can create that uh, nexus for collaboration uh, between the insurance players, regulators, and, uh, uh, and, and the markets. Um, like I said, uh, capacity development is critical, and that's what we'll focus on to start with, and we'll keep doing that. Thank you. From my perspective, I would say it's really about building trust. Um, you know, we uh, kind of talked about that as, as a group a little bit yesterday as we, we got together and that seemed to be a, a common theme. So how can we build trust? How can we grow the insurance ecosystem? Uh, how can we make a more mature market um, and do it in ways that uh, consumers trust the insurance industry? You know, folks have uh, in the past really relied on themselves and each other for savings. You know, they would have saved money, um, you know, people talk about putting money under the mattress or putting in the piggy bank or rainy day fund. And these are the types of risks that you know, we want to provide insurance for um, so that that money doesn't have to be stuffed under the mattress so that it can be used um, to purchase new things, to, to make investments uh, for a household or for a business. And that actually helps grow the economy at large. So there's um, some strong reasons, um, society-wise and, and even from the government, that they should encourage um, the growth of the insurance sector. It definitely helps uh, modernize economies. And I think with the technologies that we have, with the brain power that we have, uh, as you've seen on, on this call and elsewhere at the, the conference today, um, we can certainly uh, make this happen. And then I think the other exciting thing is that you don't have to be tied down by the way uh, that uh, folks in the United States where I live, in the UK and others have always done it either because those can come with legacy systems, those can come with other burdens. And, and so you, know, you have an ability to um, start uh, from a different place and, and to rethink things like going forward, leveraging the technology that we have today. So I agree uh, that it's a very exciting time and uh, I look forward to the innovation uh, that comes over over the next decade.